Hello and welcome to lecture 14 of Electrical Circuits 1. Today we're going to start a very different category of problems for us. We're going to start talking about dynamic systems. Dynamic systems are systems which contain energy storage elements. We're not only going to have resistors which dissipate energy, but we will also have circuit elements which can store energy from the circuit and re-release re it back to the circuit. This is going to cause us to have input-output relationships for these circuits that are differential equations now rather than algebraic equations. For the first part of today's lecture, however, before we get into the mathematics, I want to give some basic intuitive background relative to dynamic systems. Uh, in our day-to-day -day life, we're generally used to dealing with dynamic systems. We just need to recognize what those are. I'll try to introduce the basic concepts in fairly intuitive terms so that later when we get into the mathematics, we'll have an intuitive context within which to place the mathematics that we're dealing with. One thing we're going to have to worry about a lot when we deal with dynamic systems now is a time-varying response to a time-varying input. Okay, since we're going to be worried about things as functions of time, I'm going to introduce the basic time-varying signals that we will be dealing with over the rest of the course. The related educational modules are sections 2.0 and 2.1. Okay, before we get into dynamic systems, I want to talk a little bit about the previous systems that we've been dealing with. Okay, the circuits we've been analyzing so far, and how they fit in relative to the new category of circuits which are going to be dynamic and have energy storage elements. Okay, previously, any circuit that we've analyzed has not contained any energy storage elements. Our circuits all consisted of sources and resistors. Resistors can only dissipate energy. There's no energy storage going on within them. One outcome of this limitation was that any equations that we developed that describe the circuit, okay, any input-output relationships for the circuit itself, were all algebraic. They were multiplication by a number, addition by another number. We weren't taking derivatives in the circuit itself. One outcome of algebraic input-output equations is that the circuit will instantaneously respond to any change in input. So if I have a 2-volt source and I switch that suddenly to a 3-volt source, all of the voltages change immediately to a new value. Okay? We didn't have to worry really about functions of time in our analysis because our analysis was appropriate at any instant of time. For example, our inverting voltage amplifier. Okay, we have a feedback resistor R sub F, a resistor at the input R in. We have an applied input voltage and we're measuring an output voltage. The input-output relationship between V out and V in was that V out was just the negative of this resistance value divided by this resistance value times whatever V in was. So the output at some instant in time depends only on the input at that same instant in time. So if I change V in suddenly, V out also changes suddenly. This system does not remember anything that has happened to it in the past. It's responding instantly to any change in input. So let's hook this circuit up to a time-varying source and see what happens to it. So what I'm going to do is have a 2-volt source with a switch. Okay, that's go going to apply some input voltage here. Before I close this switch, this voltage will be 0. After I close this switch at t equals 5 seconds, this voltage will be 2 volts. So if I look at this as a system, with some input and output, V in, the input voltage, is going to look like this. Before time t equals 5 seconds, the input voltage is 0. At t equals 5 seconds, it suddenly jumps up to 2 volts. The output, V out, is going to be the negative of 50 ohms over 10 ohms, so negative 5 times whatever V in is. 
So at any instant in time, my output is going to be negative 5 times the input. So my output is a function of time. Before t equals 5 seconds, the input 0, negative 5 times 0 is 0. Once I hit it with this 2 volt input, my output's going to be negative 5 times 2 volts. It's going to go to negative 10 volts and stay there. Okay, so at any instant in time, if you tell me what the input is, I'll tell you what the output is. I don't need to know what happened before then. Now let's compare that sort of system response to the response we'd expect from what we call a dynamic system. So with a dynamic system, we're going to actually have energy storage elements. For us, for electrical circuits, those are going to be capacitors and inductors. We'll talk individually about these types of circuit elements later. Now, energy storage elements are everywhere. Masses store energy as velocity. Okay, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Springs store energy as a displacement. Okay, a frying pan will store energy as heat. These guys are all over the place. So these are called dynamic systems. When you write the governing equations for these, these are going to turn into differential equations. Okay? So there's going to be a rate of change with time of something associated with this, derivatives with respect to time. Don't really let that worry you at the moment. We'll have plenty of time to worry about that later. And actually, physically, what's happening is that these systems are integrating stuff. Physically, they're actually integrators. So they're performing a mathematical operation of integration. So now, since we're integrating stuff, if we apply a time varying input to the system, the output may not look exactly like the input does, right? And in fact, the output's going to depend not only on the input, but the state of the system at previous times. Okay, I'm going to now try to put that in the context of a system that you may be familiar with anyway. So my first ordinary everyday system example is going to be heating up a frying pan. If I have some frying pan represented schematically as this box, okay, I need to know the relative properties of that frying pan which allow it to store energy. Those are the mass of the frying pan and the specific heat of the material that the frying pan is made out of. Okay, so the amount of material you have and the properties of the material itself. The other thing that I need to be able to know is the temperature of this pan, T sub B. Remember, any of our resulting response is going to depend upon the previous state. So what this frying pan does is going to depend on how hot it already is. Okay. My input's going to be some heat input. I'll turn on a stove burner. So I'll start pumping some heat into here. That's going to cause this temperature, T sub B, to go up. It's not going to go up instantaneously. It's going to take time for it to respond. That's because this guy is storing energy. It's integrating the heat input that you're applying to get the body temperature. Now, as this thing heats up, you're also going to be radiating more heat out into the atmosphere. You're going to have some Q out. And actually, more specifically, the body temperature is based on an integration of the difference between Q in and Q out. If this frying pan is just sitting on the table, okay, there's no heat transfer one way or the other because the body temperature is the same as the ambient temperature. There's no net heat flux either in or out of this body. Now, I want to take a quick look at some of the mathematics, not because I want to solve the math, but because I want to show the form of the equations and kind of talk about how these equations work. Now let's take a closer look at my frying pan example and kind of identify some of the terms in the governing equation. What is happening is that, as I said before, the difference between Q in and Q out is being integrated by the mass in order to get the temperature T sub B. What that means is that the rate at which I can change the body temperature 
is not only dependent upon how much heat I pump into this, it's also dependent upon the properties of the frying pan. Okay, a frying pan with a larger mass, say a big heavy cast iron pan versus a light aluminum pan, one of those will respond more quickly to a heat input than the other one. What you're doing with this so-called differential equation is identifying the rate at which you can change something. That limitation on the rate is because you're storing energy. I also mentioned that the heat out of the mass is governed by the difference between the mass's temperature and the ambient temperature. Okay? If this frying pan is glowing red hot, it's going to be dissipating a bunch of heat to the external atmosphere. You're losing that energy. Okay, this guy here is describing the energy storage. Okay, it's got a derivative in it. Okay, it's describing a rate at which something can happen. This guy here is describing the energy dissipation. There isn't a derivative in here. This is an algebraic relationship. So far, when we've talked about electrical circuits, we've only dealt with energy dissipation, and all of our equations have been algebraic. Now, ultimately, when we get around to analyzing these, the ultimate approach is going to be to take Q out, substitute it into here. Then you have a differential equation relating Tb, T0, and the rate at which you can change T sub b. But don't let the mathematics intimidate you. Just notice that the difference between an energy storage process and an energy dissipation process is an algebraic versus a differential relationship. So this guy here is describing the energy storage. That energy is being stored as an increase in temperature of the mass. Now let's take a look at kind of a systems level view of this example. We have our physical device, which is our frying pan. We're going to assume that the heat input, Q in, is the input to our system, and our response is going to be indicated by the temperature of the frying pan, T sub b. Now we need to worry about specific functions of time that we can apply here in order to get our response out over here. For this example, what I'm going to do is suddenly apply a heat input to the frying pan. So before t equals 0, I'm not going to be heating this guy up. When t equals 0 hits, I'm going to suddenly start applying some non-zero heat input. And I'm going to remain at that value for the rest of whenever. Okay? Now, as we mentioned before, our body temperature, T sub b, is not going to respond instantaneously to this. And in fact, if you do the mathematics, which we're not going to worry about right now, what you'll see is that you start out at some initial temperature. So initially, it's at room temperature. And the temperature will climb up kind of in this exponential fashion to some kind of final temperature. Now, when we hit this final temperature, what will have happened is that the frying pan will have gotten hot enough so that the heat output to the ambient atmosphere exactly balances this heat input that you're putting in from your stove burner. The temperature no longer changes. Now, for example, now, if I start this at this temperature and I suddenly shut off my heat input, okay, so I turn the burner back off, this temperature is going to drop back down and ultimately exponentially approach room temperature again. So the shape of this response, whether it's climbing or whether it's dropping, is going to be dictated by what your input is, as well as what your initial value of the temperature is. In our previous slide, we saw that we had some signals that were going to vary with time. So now we have to deal with these type of signals, and I have some nomenclature that I need to introduce relative to time varying signals. So now we have to start worrying about turning things on, turning things off. Maybe our response doesn't respond immediately. 
So we need to describe that process appropriately. Now, when we're talking about time varying signals, signal is actually a generic type term. Okay, A signal can be pretty much anything we want to define it to be. A signal can be a voltage in our system. It can be a current. It can be, as we saw previously, a temperature. It can be a heat input. Those are all considered to be signals. They're all generically referred that way. And sometimes it disguises the physical system that we're actually dealing with. Always remember that your signal corresponds to, hopefully, some physical parameter in which you're interested. So next slide, we have a limited set of signals that we are going to need to deal with in this class. I'm going to introduce those next. Okay, There are an infinite number of potential time-varying signals. We're going to deal with three specific classes of them in this course. So the only ones we're going to be worried about are what are called step functions. We'll deal with exponential functions and sinusoids. And in fact, at this point, we're only going to introduce step functions and exponential functions. We'll deal with sinusoidal functions a lot later in the semester, but I'll go ahead and introduce those types of signals when it's more appropriate to do so and when we'll be dealing with them directly. Okay, Step functions. Step functions are based on a definition of what is called a unit step function. I will use the nomenclature u sub 0 of t to denote a unit step function. A lot of textbooks and authors will leave off the sub 0 and just call them u of t. I tend to use u of t as a generic time varying signal. Okay? So don't get too fixated on that 0. It's just to keep me happy. So the definition of a unit step function is that it is 0 for all times less than 0, and it is 1 for times greater than or equal to 0. If we graph this, it looks like this. If time is less than 0, the value of u sub 0 of t is 0. If time is 0 or bigger, the value of u sub 0 of t is just 1. Also, don't get too hung up on the value of the unit step function at t equals 0. Again, some authors will define this slightly differently. For the most part, for us, it won't matter what the value of the function is at time t equals 0. As I said, our systems are going to be doing integrations. If we integrate a value for an infinitesimal amount of time, that doesn't affect our final result. So I'm not going to worry too much about the value at t equals 0. We can generate this signal with a physical circuit. If I take a 1 volt source and apply a switch here and measure V out, if I close the switch at t equals 0 seconds, before I close the switch, V out is 0. 0 before t equals 0. This guy snaps shut at t equals 0. So V out sees this source. It becomes 1 volt for all times after the switch closes. In our circuits, if we bother to show what is generating our step function, we will typically show something that looks like this. Now, step functions are extremely useful. And in fact, in our frying pan example, if you look at the specific heat input, that I applied when I was looking at the system level viewpoint of that frying pan. It was a step input in heat input. Now, we can develop a wide range of other useful functions based on our unit step functions. One way to do that is to scale and or shift the unit step function. Scaling corresponds to multiplying our unit step function by a constant. So if we take our unit step function u0 of t and multiply it by any constant k, I get a function that is 0 for t less than 0, and it is k for t greater than 0. So if t is less than 0 at 0, if t is greater than or equal to 0, it has a value of k. We can also shift this unit step function 
moving it backwards and forwards in time. Remember, u0 of some argument is 0 when that argument is less than 0, and it is 1 when that argument is greater than 0. If I subtract some value a from t, okay, this guy here, u0 of t minus a, is 0 if t is less than a. Okay, if t is less than a, this is a negative number. Okay, u0 of a negative number is 0. If t is greater than or equal to a, the argument here is positive. The unit step function with a positive argument is 1. So if a is a positive number, what we've done is shifted the unit step function to the right by an amount a. If a is a negative number, so if we have u0 of t plus some positive number, it actually corresponds to shifting this function to the left. Quick example of scaling and shifting unit step functions. Let's sketch 5 times u0 of t minus 3. Let's apply the scaling last. So first, I'll do something that looks like u0 of t minus 3. So u0 of t minus 3 is equal to 0 if t is less than 3, and it is 1 if t is greater than or equal to 3. So we have a function of time u0 of t minus 3 is 0 up until time t equals 3, and it is 1 subsequent to that. Now we can scale this function by multiplying it by 5. My final result is 5u0 of t minus 3 is 0 for time less than 3, it increases immediately to 5 for all times greater than 3. Now let's do an example where we have some physical operation and we want to represent a physical voltage here in terms of unit step functions. Okay, so we're going to provide a mathematical representation of this voltage. We're going to have a 6 volt constant source here with a switch connecting it to these terminals. At time t equals 1 second, I'm going to close this switch. I'm going to leave it closed until time t equals 3 seconds, at which point I'm going to reopen the switch. So this voltage is going to be 0 volts before this switch is closed. While the switch is closed, this voltage will be 6 volts. And then after the switch is open, this voltage will go back to 0 volts. So graphically, this function, V of t, is going to be 0 up until I close the switch at time t equals 1 second. It's going to go to 6 volts until I open the switch again at time t equals 3 seconds, after which it will go back to 0. Now I want to use step functions to represent this function. The trick is that I can combine multiple steps to create this sort of pulse-like arrangement. As long as I don't worry about reopening this switch again, okay, if I'm just closing the switch at t equals 1 second, I can use a step function, which is just u0 of t minus 1 times 6 volts. That increases to 6 volts at t equals 1 second and stays there. My problem is to now turn this off again. What I can do is, after t equals 3 seconds, subtract off this value. So if I add another step function, which starts at t equals 3 seconds and goes to a negative 6 volts, so here I have minus 6 times u0 of t minus 3 seconds. Now. After t equals 3 seconds, if I add these two together, they cancel out and I get 0 volts. So v of t can be represented as 6 
times u0 of t minus 1 minus u0 of t minus 3. Another common application of step functions is to do what is called windowing. Okay, I have a function here which is defined in terms of another function, but only over a particular period of time. So f of t is cosine of t between 0 and 2 pi seconds, otherwise it's 0. I want to write that as a single function which is defined for all times. I can do that using unit step functions. Let's take a closer look at this function. If I plot cosine of t, it is going to look something like this. It is defined for all times from negative infinity to infinity. It is periodic with period 2 pi. What I'm doing with this guy here is saying I'm only going to retain this function from 0 to 2 pi, and it's going to be 0 everywhere else. So my function is going to go back to 0 for times above 2 pi, and it is going to be 0 for times below 0. So this is the function that I want to replicate. Notice that I can get this function by taking my previous cosine function and multiplying it by another function which is 0 everywhere less than 0 and bigger than 2 pi and is 1 inside this range. So my function is going to be 1 between 0 and 2 pi and 0 outside of that range. If I take this function here, multiply it by cosine of t, I preserve cosine of t between 0 and 2 pi. Outside of that range, I multiply cosine of t by 0, and I get the function that I want. This function, I can use the trick that I used previously. This can be represented as u0 of t, and then I subtract off u0 of t minus 2 pi. So this function looks like u0 of t minus u0 of t minus 2 pi. If I take cosine of t, and multiply it by that rectangular window, I get f of t. I do not have to specify a particular time range and make the function look as if it's two different functions. It's very nicely defined from negative infinity to infinity. The other class of signals that's going to be immediately useful to us in this class are exponential functions. I will describe my exponential functions in this way. f of t will be some number, capital A here, times e to the minus t divided by tau. Tau is a very special number. It is another constant. It is called the time constant. Okay. For this class, the time constant tau will always be a positive number. Now if I plot this function, I get something that looks like this. When t is equal to 0, I have e to the 0. Any number raised to the 0th power is 1, so the value of f at 0 is a. For positive times, this becomes a negative number since the time constant is always positive. As t increases, this becomes a larger and larger negative number. So e to this becomes smaller and smaller. So this decreases what is called exponentially with time. For negative times, this is a positive number, which is getting larger and larger as t becomes more and more negative. So this number, e to some positive number, as that positive number gets larger, increases without bound. Now in this class, when we're analyzing some circuit, we're generally going to be concerned with the circuit's response after something happens.
we'll flip a switch and we'll want to see how the circuit responds after that switch is flipped. So generally, we're going to not be concerned with what we will consider to be negative times. Okay? We don't care what the circuit's been doing before we flip the switch. We just want to find out what's happening as a function of time after the switch is flipped. So generally, we're only going to define our exponential functions for positive times. So you'll see something like this a lot, where f of t is a e to the minus t over tau, but we're restricting ourselves to times greater than 0. And we will assume that the value of the function is 0 before time equals 0. It's probably more convenient to rewrite this in terms of unit step functions. We can take our previous function, multiply that by u0 of t. That very nicely makes this function 0 for times less than 0. If I plot this function, or equivalently this one, I get something that looks like this. When t is 0, the value of the function is a, it decreases exponentially with time. Now I want to talk about the importance of the time constant. I've got this little dot here. That is where the time constant is, tau. Okay, At a time tau, by definition of how exponential functions work, the value of the function has decreased to 36.8% of its initial value. Okay, So what happens is that this function f of t decreases by 63.2%, or 1 minus this, every tau seconds. There's one other kind of neat thing about tau. If I take a line that is tangent to this curve at t equals 0 and extend that down, that will intersect the time axis at t equals tau. It's going to turn out that tau is going to be a fundamental quantity which describes how our circuit or our system behaves. We need to know this. Memorize this. It's one of the few things that's worthwhile memorizing. Tau is important because it describes how quickly this exponential curve decays. As the time constant gets longer and longer, this curve decays more and more slowly. Okay, The rate of decay is governed by tau. And in fact, in the limit, as tau goes to infinity, this curve doesn't decay at all, and we end up with our step function again. It's 0 for times less than 0, and it's whatever it is for times greater than 0. Tau, when we start doing circuit analysis, will be an extremely important quantity that describes the circuit. For our previous frying pan problem, for example, I said that the system's response is governed by things like how massive the frying pan is, how, what the frying pan is made of. Those parameters are changing the time constant of that frying pan. If you take a light frying pan that's made out of aluminum and you have it heated up to some temperature and you turn off the heat, it'll cool down quickly. It has a short time constant. If you take a big, heavy cast iron frying pan, you heat it up to the same temperature and turn off the heat, its temperature will decay very slowly. You've changed the time constant of the system by changing the mass and the material of the frying pan. In a very real sense, tau describes the system's response. I want to emphasize that exponential functions are going to be really important to us. The reason for that is, is that ordinary linear differential equations with constant coefficients have solutions that are generally expressed in terms of exponential functions. When we talk more about differential equations and the solutions of differential equations, I'll clarify that more. But this is the type of differential equation that we're going to de be dealing with. We're going to see a lot of exponential functions. In fact, 
we like them so much that we're going to start representing sinusoids as exponential functions, which will require us to introduce the concept of complex exponentials. The power of the exponential is going to become a complex number eventually. So pay close attention to these. This concludes lecture 14. So we've introduced the concept of a dynamic system. We've talked about energy storage. We've started introducing the idea that things will be changing with time from here on out. What we haven't done really is any of the mathematics associated with that. So the next couple of lectures will introduce our specific circuit elements which can store energy, capacitors and inductors, and will provide voltage current characteristics for those types of elements. So we'll have voltage current characteristics for resistors, capacitors, and inductors. After we've got that basic information, we can start combining those elements into overall electrical circuits to perform some task and analyzing those circuits and solving the governing differential equations that describe those circuits' response.